Welcome to this uh, special uh, discussion. It's part of a series that is part of what we call the Budget Month. Minister of Finance uh, every year, uh, in partnership with other partner, with other partners like civil society, uh, mark the Budget Month. It's part of the Budget Transparency Initiative by government to improve awareness by Ugandans of the budget process, plus improvement of collaboration between government, civil society, and private sector. So there's a bit of collaboration there, and most especially awareness. Apparently, the budget affects you. Either you know it or you don't. And uh, we are here uh, this afternoon to discuss uh, how uh, the citizen, you, can have a role, things you should know about the budget. Because uh, once the minister is going to read next Thursday, but one, next week Thursday, the minister is going to be reading the budget. Uh, it shouldn't pass over you like uh, one of those annual events, perennial. Because in there, apart from the taxation, there are things that even provide opportunities. And uh, this afternoon in the studio, uh, we have gentlemen who are qualified to say the things they're going to say. And first on my immediate uh, left there, probably right on your uh, TV, Mr. Julius uh, Mukunda, as if director for the uh, CS bag, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group. Uh, Julius, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next to him, on his left, is Mr. Kenneth Mugambe. Many of you don't know him. Sometimes he's the man who is very busy to make sure what the minister reads and everything you see is in order. So today he has come to speak to us. Mr. Kenneth Mugambe is Director, Budget, Minister of Finance and Economic Development. Uh, Kenneth, welcome. Thank you. And lastly is um, Mr. Dennis Kato, uh, who is the manager in charge of projects at the Uganda Revenue Authority. So we have this gentleman qualified. Let me start with Julius. Uh, the theme of this year's uh, budget month is how is the budget shaping up the role of the citizen in the budget process. So they are thinking about you. Yeah. But we want to see what's the relevance of that theme so that it's not just a passing statement. Mm -hmm. Julius, let me start with you. When we speak about the budget and the citizen, what really do we mean? So it's not the sentence. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it is very simple. Uh, I think what we need to understand is that uh, why do we make the budget? Mm. We, we make the budget because we want to uplift the standards of our, com of our, of our people. Absolutely. And, uh, and over the time, that is the link we have been trying to, to see whether, whether actually it happens. Mm. Uh, is that as we prepare the budget, is it actually responding to the needs uh, of the people that we are trying to target, the Ugandans? So you hear of poverty, is, is, we have poverty issues, so mm. is it been trying to address the issues to do with the poverty? But among other Im most important part is that one of the, uh, of the, of the gap we found out is around issues of participation. So if I'm trying to address your problem, have I consulted you to know what actually is your problem? Mm, good question. And, uh, and I think uh, with the national budget month you're talking about, it is one of the things that we are trying to address. To what extent can we ensure that citizens participate in the planning and the budgeting process? Mm. Because if we can do it very well, then there is a greater chance that we are actually addressing the real problems of the people. So, for example, I mean, if you, see, if you hear that you are, you are taking cassava cuttings to Karamoja, mm. if you sat with the Karamojonga and say, what exactly do you want? Would they, do you think they would definitely think of cassava cuttings? Maybe they might think of something else. Mm, Demand-driven. So that is something that, that this National Budget Month is trying to, to, to close, to say, okay, uh, Ugandans, this is the National Budget Month. This is what your government has been doing. And actually, if it had not been called COVID, you, you would see most of the you know, agencies at Kororo displaying that the money that we have been given mm -hmm. by government, which is the taxpayer, is this is what it has done. But also in the next financial year, this is what we plan to do. Yeah. And, and I think that is what we are trying to do, and that's what the budget is supposed to be meant to mm. do. Okay. Yes. Uh, Kenneth, uh, let me turn to you. Yes. The citizen, who is this citizen here? You see, when the people see mm -hmm. budget, it's numbers, it's, you know, maybe it's complicated, it's a perception. Mm -hmm. Who is the citizen who is supposed to be <laughs> attached to this budget? Okay, uh, thank you, Samuel. The, the citizen is uh, the entire Ugandan population, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in their respective capacities 
as citizens, and as far as they are beneficiaries of what comes out in the budget. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I think what uh, you realize is that uh, uh, people do benefit at different levels. Uh, of course, depending on uh, uh, their socioeconomic mm -hmm. circumstances, uh, depending on their needs. But uh, at the end of the day, every Ugandan citizen, every Ugandan, practically, in fact, even uh, people who are resident in Uganda, yeah in one way or the other, are impacted on by the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it is important that everybody picks interest in the budget. That's why uh, we started this initiative uh, of the budget month. Initially, mm -hmm. we started with a week, actually. But then we realized that a week was not long Sufficient. enough. It didn't mm -hmm. give us enough time uh, to be able to engage. So the whole essence uh, of the budget month is to engage the entire population in one way or the other through different channels, mm. uh, either TV, radio, you know, social media. But at the end of the day, to ensure that everybody is reached, you know, by and of course uh, not only reached actually, but to, to ensure that ev everybody picks interest, yeah. picks interest in the budget. Mm. Because as I said, at the end of the day, it will impact on you as somebody who is a citizen of Uganda, somebody who is a resident. Uh, in Uganda, okay. either through the services which we are delivering, mm -hmm. or the fact that you pay taxes. Absolutely. You need to have interest in this budget. So okay. that's really the whole essence of uh, uh, having the budget month. Okay. Yes. Very well said. Um, let me stand, Mr. Kato, you are at the front end. Uh, Kenneth here said uh, uh, paying taxes. Let's speak about the citizen and the budget. People think taxes may be apart from the budget, but it's part of the budget. <laughs> Very fundamental. Mm -hmm. Connect to us my role vis-a-vis -vis taxation and the budget. We saw a complete cycle of understanding where my role as a citizen is. Uh, thank you, Samuel. When we talk about the citizen, mm. in the eyes of um, a revenue service <coughs> that we are providing as URA, we, we, we take it to another level. There is a citizen who is directly affected mm. by what the budget is going to, to profess. The budget comes with certain proposals, both at policy and at administrative, mm. there is that particular citizen who is automatically going to be affected. That citizen could be heading an institution in yeah. the private sector, could be heading an institution in government, could also be a partner of some business out there. Mm. But it could also be a direct, direct benefit of uh, what the budget is coming across uh, with. So uh, the citizen at URA will look at it at mostly the direct uh, person who is affected. Mm. But of course, at the end of the day, uh, the citizen is that Ugandan who is ultimately affected by the changes which the budget might come ac across with. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, uh, in school, you say budget is about um, income and expenditure, mm. simply. But uh, you mentioned that is policy mm -hmm. and then other um, issues, uh, d direction that uh, we should take pay attention to. Julius, engagement. Mm. So, um, Kenneth and the Minister of Finance do the document mm. and the minister reads it. Mm. But we are supposed to engage. Mm. Help me as a <laughs> citizen. How do I engage <laughs> those people? <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, five years ago, you would not have this panel. Absolutely. It, 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 it would be extremely very difficult because mm. there were very brilliant people in the Ministry of Finance who would sit and make the budget for you mm. and pass it. Up to now, I still wonder how those guys would do it. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but now is that, as the, at, in fact, by the end of this financial year, mm -hmm. 30th June, a new, process is, a new process starts of preparing the budget for next financial year. Mm -hmm. And as a citizen, I think one of the, f the first, first, and mo first and foremost is for you to say, okay, if the budget has come to my community, mm -hmm. and I mean it has a, it has a sub county level, it's in the school, it's in the health center, at the water office, if it has come, do I know what money has come to my area? Mm -hmm. Good question. And that information is provided for. In fact, part of budget transparency is to say every spending unit mm -hmm. at the local government level must publish its budget. And that's why when you go to school, one of the requirements you must publish your budget at the noticeable so they know the money that has come to that school and what you're going to use it for. So as it says, it's your number one responsibility yeah. to say, okay, the money for school has come, this is how it's going to be spent, mm -hmm. and to ensure that that money actually is spent. That's your number one responsibility. That that borehole was budgeted for, money has come for its repair. Mm -hmm. 
and follow it up to ensure that it is done. When it is not done, then you raise, you raise an, you raise an alarm. Mm -hmm. So that's your number one responsibility. But second and most important also is the planning process, because the budget doesn't just come out of the blue. There's a planning process, yes. and I, I told you. So at the parish level, the, the, the parish development committee sits down and makes priorities. The sub county does the same, mm -hmm. and also the district the same. So at those different levels, there is an opportunity for a citizen to engage and say, please, for us, although you are, you are telling us to, to repair that borehole, we think that that crossing that river is the most important part for us to engage this fi next financial year. the borehole. Yes. And if all of us were really, really vigilant on that, mm. the, priorities, the priorities really would benefit us more than, any, than anything else. Because there is nobody at the Minister of Finance, Minister of Energy, who would be, oh, what, who would be thinking that uh, probably the, you know, who, who wants to think better on your behalf, if I, if I, if I can say. It is you as a citizen to do that. So that's, that's one. So the other important element, for, of course, is that once the parish, sub-county, district have done that, mm. then now the national government also begins this planning process, and they call them the local government budget consultative meetings, mm -hmm. where now everybody comes to begin to set up priorities, look at the challenges that they faced previous year and how they're going to address it. Yeah. So opportunities are there. Last year is a whole issue about information. And again, it has been a long way. You'd find out that probably five, maybe six years, ten years ago, mm. getting budget information was extremely very difficult. I was there, I remember, as a journalist. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> the best they could do is a huge volume document of 1,000 pages that you could just couldn't even comprehend mm. with it. But today, wherever you are, you just click on a budget website and you just get all the information that, 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 that you want. I think for me, these are great milestones we need to celebrate. And that as citizens, if we become ma more proactive, mm. and in fact, sometimes I, I'm saying probably, is there too much corruption or there is too much information mm. about, about this? There's, there's more information about it. Suddenly. Mm. That people are able to identify very quickly than, than, than previously. Mm. So for a citizen, I think, for me, that's the message I can send. That let us be very active. Let us look out for these opportunities. And definitely, our priorities will be able to uh, to to be for us and not for anybody else. And we'll come back to later to the issue of information. Let me let me turn to Kenneth. Kenneth, uh, uh, Julius has explained that you know there is the you know sub county, parish, and upwards. People sometimes think that means of finance just does its own things, mm. and I think it's a perception. Do you people listen to the things that come from down? And when you do, what happens? You can take us through the process. Okay. Okay, thank you. First, first of all, uh, uh, what Julius, I think, has explained uh, is the structured process, mm -hmm. uh, which more or less is what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, where we have, you know, a timetable, uh, we agree on when we consult who, mm -hmm. at which point, and then get the issues. But I think in terms of uh, the information that the government gets to understand the needs of the citizen, it comes from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. Multiple, multiple sources. So in addition to the structured process, yeah. Uh, where we go, you know, either hold the national conference on the budget mm. or even go actually to the local governments and have, uh, you know, local government consultations. You realize, if you think of, uh, like, the situation, uh, the kind of exercise, exercise we've just gone through, yeah. the electoral process, the electoral process helps political leaders mm. to actually directly engage. And, and that's why, at the end of the day, a budget is actually a political instrument. Mm. So the assumption is that these political leaders, as they engage the citizens, when they are campaigning, mm. because that actually gives them a direct opportunity to hear from the citizens and understand, mm. you know, what the needs of the citizens are, what the perception of the services is. Mm. Now, if you recall, uh, in 1997, when we did the, the first poverty eradication action plan, mm. the, actually the poverty eradication action plan came out of the electoral process of 1996, mm -hmm. after the 1995 constitution. So after the 1995 constitution, uh, don't ask me where I was because uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask. That, that, that might <laughs> make me look old. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in 1995, mm -hmm. when the new constitution was uh, uh, promulgated, and then the elections of 1996, the political leaders mm -hmm. traversed the whole country, and it was at that point actually that the president. His Excellency the President mm. came face to face with the reality. And it was actually out of that yeah. that we, f we 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 start we we prepared the poverty eradication action plan because mm. what was actually clear was that there was there were high levels of poverty in the countryside. Yeah. So essentially, when you talk of uh, engagement, you know, participation, 
the point I want to make is that uh, this information comes from different sources yeah. and from different processes actually that go on. Mm -hmm. Of course, one other major process uh, that at times is under and uh, estimated, and it goes to answer the question you are asking, whether Ministry of Finance simply sits. Mm. So on the one hand, we listen to the voices of the political leaders. Yeah. Okay? They have gone out in the field where they are looking for votes, mm. and they have actually come face to face with the reality mm -hmm. of what is on the ground. What services do we need? And that's why they come up with these manifestos. Yeah. And those directly inform the budget. Mm. The second aspect is, uh, of course, we are to take studies and the uh, you know, surveys and uh, censuses. Mm. Now, when you do a census or a survey, for example, like right now, uh, uh, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics has just finished uh, the household survey mm. uh, of 2019-2020. Now, the household survey is a very major mm. instrument through which we monitor household incomes. Research. Yes, mm. definitely. They, they get the information from the population itself in yeah. terms of their consumption mm. and use that information to understand the trends in household income, the incomes of the population. Because mm. you realize income is one of the key aspects of every person's life. Okay? So we use that information yeah. to inform the policies that we put in the budget. Mm. And then, of course, uh, how we allocate the resources to ensure that we target the budget to address those challenges mm. that, have, that have come out. When you do uh, uh, the censuses themselves, actually, Information which comes out of the census, the data that is collected, yeah. informs the budget that the Ministry of Finance prepares. Mm. So it is actually not necessarily, it is, it is definitely not true uh, that the Ministry of Finance, even if we didn't actually use the structured one, uh, as I said, uh, which actually the structured in a way is simply uh, consulting the elites, the Mukundas actually, <laughs> who are not necessarily in the government, <laughs> but they are, they are the elites in the civil, in the NGO world. Yeah. Those are the ones actually who are largely targeted by this uh, formal structured the, the consultation. consultation. Because mm. when I when I call a workshop uh, in uh, a locality or in Kampala, it's not the ordinary person most mm. likely. Of course, the assumption is that Mukunda is speaking on behalf of the ordinary person. Yeah. But as I said, beyond that, which we do, mm. we again look at those different aspects of uh, engaging processes which engage, yeah. which where we get the voices of the people themselves. And then, of course, uh, as, I, as, as he said, uh, we engage them as well. Mm. Because to some extent, they, they bring some perspective uh, that probably would not have seen uh, uh, being a, a civil society, especially where they have grassroots mm, civil rich. society mm. institutions, mm -hmm. which actually probably go uh, where at times we don't actually go. And actually, on our side, that, was one, that is one of the motivation uh, for having a partnership mm. uh, with them. Uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, to work as partners, to ensure that wha where, where we cannot reach, yeah. we take advantage uh, of mm -hmm. these institutions. Mm -hmm. Either send their information or engage the citizens mm -hmm. to understand, you know, issues which concern them mm -hmm. so that this information can be fed back uh, to the Ministry of Finance. Okay. And then we use that information, of course, uh, to come up with the budget proposals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, very interesting. Yes. Yes. I like the way you have taken us through on the multi-pronged uh, approaches right. to mm -hmm. how you come up with the budget. We'll come back to that issue a while ago. Mm. Let me turn to Mr. Kato. What does URA know about engaging the citizen? Finance and Julius have given us, you know, <laughs> the perspective. What does URA know about engaging the citizen? Because you are the front end. And I've had questions of, we give you our taxes, but they're not used properly. You are the ones who are supposed to answer. What do you know about engaging the citizen? What can we learn from your experience? Mm. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Yes, URA is one of the key partners engaging uh, citizens, mm. partnering with the Ministry of Finance. In fact, we've done a lot of um, plans that we are doing for this corporate plan that we've just developed yeah. of uh, intensely engaging the citizens. And uh, what do we know? When we get there, the feedback that comes to us, mm. of course, we are the first recipients of every government policy. We are the first recipients. All the fire. <laughs> yes, all the fire comes to us. And mm. uh, we, we, we have a population which sometimes does not even separate uh, the two, but really that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. We are all government. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do we plan? The issue is how do we plan to engage further? We have a very intensive um, plan going forward yeah. with uh, with our new leadership that you know uh, is in place. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's highly interactive that we are coming up with, and uh, we are we are hoping that the strategy that we've developed of of, of educating the taxpayers mm -hmm. is is going to be uh, received. And, uh, and people will actually pick it up and, and, and enjoy this service uh, that we are partnering with government yeah. <coughs> to deliver uh, to the people. But also regarding that, um, uh, from what Kenneth had, uh, had, had submitted, the idea of that the ministry just comes up with things and mm. dumps them there. It's a perception. It's a perception. Mm. 
However, we, we've, as you are, we've participated, uh, part of our mandate is to advise government mm -hmm. on some of the policies. Mm -hmm. Some policies come up, and when we actually sit and we revisit the information, we revisit the implication, we realize it could affect a certain sector, it mm -hmm. could promote one, it could affect uh, how people perceive government policies. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, URA is also strong mm -hmm. in making sure that um, we, we support uh, the ministry and the other arms of government so that what comes out to, to the people is 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 is, is beneficial mm. to government and to the people uh, out there okay thank you thank you so much uh we are we just want to do the last uh, question on on this issue of citizen because the theme julius um how can we do better we have seen that is kind of say there that uh, sometimes the political leaders sometimes research mm. how can we do better to he said the the elite mm. But there are others who are not elite, but they, they matter. Mm. I'll give you an example. I've seen some stories on um, Operation Wealth Creation and uh, the NADs and mm. how they distribute the things. Now, there's a lot of cynicism that, ah, money is being banned. Until you go down there and talk to somebody given um, a heifer, and that within three years, something is happening in their lives mm -hmm. in a microwave but household income. Mm -hmm. Now, that person may not know that that whole thing has something to do with that thing called <laughs> budget up there. <laughs> How can we do better so that we go beyond the elite farm to go by Kenneth's uh, session there mm. and make sure that uh, almost not everyone, but almost everyone knows that I have a stake in this process? Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I think this is the first, this is one of the strategies that we're putting in place. Mm. Like, like Kenneth was saying, it was one week. I mean, it was not there anyway, mm -hmm. in the first place. It was not there. Mm -hmm. And once we, it was done for one week, then there was this, uh, it was very important to do it for a whole month. Yeah. And had it not been co 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 I mean, we wouldn't even be doing even more mm -hmm. than what, what, we are, what we are planning. So that's one. Mm -hmm. But I think we can also do better, especially concerning the fact that how many languages do we have in this country? Quite a few. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite a few. <laughs> quite a few. You, yes. could, you could say that. So I, I have... I have seen the excitement. Mm. If you go, some of us who come from Western Uganda, if you yeah. go on, on, on TV, on other uh, uh, media channels, and mm. you're speaking the local language, how people perceive it. It's powerful. It is so powerful. Mm. I, I have seen it when I'm in Northern Uganda and you're with other colleagues mm. who are explaining there and mm. how many people call. I think that's an area definitely that we need to, to, to begin to look at. Uh, it is very expensive, that's for sure, I can tell you, it's not, <laughs> not, yeah. it's not simple, but I think that's an area that definitely if you can invest more, uh, more then you can have actually more people getting into... Uh, Communicate in the language of the heart. Of the heart, mm. what people can understand. The other part is what we are talking even before this talk show, yeah. is how can we break down the numbers? Mm. When we say GDP, what does that mean to another mm. person? And, 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 and I think for me is, is, is another challenge that we are facing, mm. to break down the information so that an ordinary person can easily understand what it means for them. Yeah. That's uh, what I think us, I mean, who are working in this area, that we need definitely to be able to begin to, to, to look at. Because, yes, we have the, the budget website, for example, we go get the numbers out, but to what extent can we translate that? Yeah, translation is important. To, to ensure that an ordinary person can be able to understand and say, okay, the, the budget has been read. Mm -hmm. These are my benefits. Mm -hmm. This is how I can access the benefits. This and, this, and and you ask that, this is how I should prepare myself. Mm -hmm. Because again, the budget is just not on the, just on, on a plate for you to just go and pick. You need to prepare yourself. Yeah. If you want to get, to get a haifa from nuts, mm -hmm. you want to get, a, you know, chicken or what, there are things you need to do yourself mm -hmm. to prepare and to receive these particular things. So how do you prepare yourself to ensure that you can actually benefit from, from this budget? Mm -hmm. They have been talking about oil jobs, oil jobs. I don't think these jobs will find us in our households. Absolutely not. They, they, they don't. They, they, they are things as citizens we need to prepare. So that kind of information, I think, is also very important. Mm -hmm. To let citizens know and say, okay, uh, you need to do the following to get people to benefit effectively from, uh, from, from the budget process. Yeah. And, and I think that is something that we could work on and, and improve. Uh, lastly, for me, I think is uh, we can also do better. And I think for me, this is uh, an area I found very challenging. Mm. If the way we communicate is not exaggerated, mm. 
Because our politicians sometimes really just over things and say, hey, we, we are going to eradicate poverty tomorrow. And it, it takes a long time <laughs> Not to realistic. do that. I've been fighting with the issue of, of for example, of the, the, uh, the, the you know, there is the issue of saying that we are going to be middle income. <laughs> Wednesday. Mm. It's a good idea. It's yeah. good to, you know, to look ahead and say this is where we want to be. It's very good. But mm -hmm. also, I think it's always also to be very realistic and give the population uh, the, the expectation mm. that we can be able to deliver to them. So that once people are not over expecting, yeah. then at least they can be prepared to receive the little and also invest, invest it. Perhaps effective. you can over deliver. Well, yes, mm. you can over deliver. I mean, mm. if you, that, that would be far, far, far better than saying this is what you tend to do and you keep on falling short for mm. a very long time. Yes. Okay, very good. Strategies. And uh, you can see that many times discussions of this type, people just talk. You see we are turning towards analysis but solution. Yeah. Yeah, solution is, is the... Yeah, so whoever watches says, okay, there's a takeaway there. Mm. Um, let me turn to Kenneth. I see a 56 billion funding for community mobilization and mindset change. That's in the program. Bring it down to the citizen. What does that mean? It's coming in the next financial year. Mm -hmm. Mindset change and community mobility. What is that? Okay, in, in the budget of next year, mm -hmm. one of the major areas of focus is what we call the parish development model. Yes. So next year we're going to be implementing the parish development model. Essentially, uh, the parish development model's objective is to bring all these issues mm -hmm. to the lowest unit of government. Uh, and uh, from our assessment, uh, we think the parish is much nearer to the citizen. Omuruka. Exactly. Mm. Omuruka in different languages. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, initially, our major uh, area of uh, service delivery was a sub-county. Mm. But we realized that sub-county is uh, slightly a bit uh, removed, is, yeah. is a bit far, you know, from the household, from the citizen. Mm. And of course, at the same time, we, for now, do not have all the resources we need uh, for example, to go lower than the parish. Mm -hmm. So in immediately what we are going to do in the coming financial year is to go to the parish level. So we have identified the uh, four pillars uh, of the parish uh, model. Yeah. Uh, the key ones which we are going to implement next financial year mm -hmm. uh, is the revolving fund. Uh, we are going to put money, and this money will be directly sent mm -hmm. uh, to the parishes. Now, before these resources are used and properly used, yeah. You need, you know, community mobilization mm. and mindset mm. change. Okay, good. You, you need to ensure that you engage, you know, the population, the citizens. Mm. Uh, because at the end of the day, the citizens need to identify, you know, credible projects. Because this money is essential actually to contribute to improving the incomes of the citizens mm. in terms of income generating activities. Actually, what has, uh, why this uh, scheme has come up uh, is because of the fact that we still have a big population uh, that is in subsistence economy. Yeah. Uh, you have heard the, the president talk about this uh, issue. Mm, yeah. uh, of course, the numbers vary, but almost 68% of the Ugandan population, yeah. meaning that these are people who are producing for consumption. So the whole objective of the parish model, at mm. least as far as uh, uh, that pillar of, of, of uh, the revolving fund is concerned, yeah. uh, is to ensure that uh, citizens are able to engage in economic activities. Mm. Activities which can help them to generate income, you know, beyond subsistence. Just eating. Eating, uh, producing what you are eating. Mm. So, so that whatever you are producing, you are able to produce for what you consume, but you can actually save something which you can actually, which can, you can sell mm -hmm. and be able to generate income. And of course, get out of poverty uh, ultimately. Yeah. So, so the community mobilization and mindset change uh, funding <coughs> is exactly for helping, you know, the the, the government leadership, yeah. you know, at those levels, mm -hmm. at the parish level, mm -hmm. to mobilize the community and to ensure that they, ha they are given, a, you know, the tools or are equipped with the knowledge to be able to effectively engage in this program once the program starts. Hey, that's yes. very interesting. Uh, Julius, I, I'll come back to you, Mr. Gado. Julius, now we have uh, one example mm. of bringing down the budget to you. You see? Mm. What do you want the citizen to do? They, they are listening to you, perhaps. Mm. Oh, yeah. Kenneth has stated uh, <laughs> What do you want the citizen to do? Because 460 billion is going there. Yeah. I mean, yes, and, and, I, and that's, and uh, to those who, some of us have been supporting the parish model, mm. is that for the first time, for the first time, 
I am seeing an ordinary person actually picking a share of the national cake. Really? People have said that <laughs> it comes to 38 million, 39 million per parish. Per parish that it is yeah. so little. Mm. Let me tell you. 38 million in a parish mm. is a billion. Yeah. Yes, 38 billion is a pocket change for some people mm. at the national level. Mm. But that in a parish, I'm telling you, is, is, will cause a big, is, is going to cause a big change. Mm. And, and, and as such, let me alert my, my fellow hey. citizens. Yeah. Let really? us ensure that we monitor how that money is going to be utilized. Because you see, at, a, at a parish level, you know each other. Mm. You know who is going to take the money. You know whether they have the capacity to pay back. That's mm. the number one. Mm. You know whether the, uh, you know the kind of bills they are going to gauge it to. Mm. In fact, at the parish level, people would be able to say, we can't give you our money because you trade in items that are not saleable <laughs> in the community. It is, mm. it, it's going to be extremely very easy mm. at, the parish, at the parish level. And the people are saying, ah, come on, money is going to be stolen. Mm. Hey, Who says is is stealing is the monopoly of local governments only? <laughs> money is being stolen. But I think for me, at the local government level, is, it is when, you, when you are demanding for accountability, mm. it is so simpler at the local government level than at the ministry up in Kampara. Mm. Why? Because at the local government level, they know themselves. In fact, I pity these parish chiefs who, who would pick a habit of picking any money. Because mm. the ordinary people, these parishioners, will chase them mm. and grab them by themselves. Mm. So I expect high levels of transparency at the local government level. Of course, those other issues, I mean, issues to deal with corruption might notice, but I know that at the local government level, it is so easy for them to track that. So for an ordinary person, mm. this is the first step. I'm looking forward for Kenneth to allocate more money. That's that's that, that's one thing to see more money really coming from these ministries and going further to further to the parish uh, issues to build the capacity at the parish level that they can then we handle this money. And I'm yeah. glad there is this uh, mindset change uh, resources, uh, recruitment of more uh, parish chiefs so mm. that at least money can be able to can be able to reach, and for citizens to prepare themselves. Mm. If there is money a revolving fund, what kind of business are you prepared? to borrow for yeah. and be able to improve on your incomes. If a coffee farmer, are you going to do that? If you are engaged in poultry, are you going to do that? And considering the fact that uh, the biggest majority, the 68% of our population is engaged in subsistence farming, I'm seeing really very great impact. And I, and I'm positive about, uh, I'm positive to, uh, and I think uh, one thing I've learned, now that there's the parish model and there's what Kenneth has said, uh, the money, government should sometimes go back and check, check the impact, profile the impact actually, because sometimes actually there, so you know how it works. No, best. I, I have always challenged them. Yeah, there is so much good that has taken place yeah. at the local government level that government has not been able to, to profile it. The only thing is when the bad thing happens, <laughs> it just takes over the whole, the, 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 the whole thing. But they are, I think they are fundamental good things that have taken place mm. that we can provide and learn from them on how it, ha on how it has happened. Yeah. Those failures, we can also learn from them why they have failed mm. and then improve on them next time. And, and I think for me that's part of, of the learning process that all of us need to be able to engage with. Kenneth, how do I even know that you have now released the money? You do a press conference at Minister of Finance. I know about it, but... I don't know. It, it may not get down there. NTV may have it and, you know, this other, but some small FM down there. How do I even know yeah, that the money has come? That the money for the parish model has gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is important that uh, information flows, mm -hmm. you know, to the citizens. Uh, and that has been one of the uh, major areas of uh, interest that we have been looking at. You know, how do we ensure that information is accessed by the citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, as you, yeah, as you imagine, the, the different segments of society uh, can access information through different means. Yeah. So we are trying to target, you know, all those different, uh, you know, whether it is uh, uh, the media, you know, like MTV, mm -hmm. whether it is uh, sending information by telephone, mm -hmm. uh, which is practically every Ugandan, you know, adult has. Mm -hmm. so SMS. Look at, uh, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. via SMS. Yeah. So we are trying to look at that. Mm -hmm. But uh, specifically, in terms of uh, the money, we raise money in four quarters uh, of the financial year, mm -hmm. uh, which is July, September, October, December, January, March, and then April, June. Yeah. So money is raised in those four quarters, quarters mm -hmm. four tranches, uh, uh, if you want. Yeah. And uh, as a Minister of Finance, to ensure predictability of the resources uh, 
to enable people who are who, you know both the beneficiaries of the resources mm. but also the government officials you know who deliver the services you know to ensure that there is predictability and they can plan better yeah we made a commitment to release money by the tenth day of the first month of the quarter tenth day by first the month day of the quarter, of the quarter. Uh. so by the tenth of july money has been released by the 10th of October, money has been released for second quarter. By the 10th That's of January, right. money has been released. By the 10th of April, money has been released. Now, we have also gone a step further, mm. but particularly for the local governments. Yeah. Now, for the local governments, because again, we know they have challenges in terms of the, you know, capacities, mm. human capacities. So we allow them more time. So the last release that we make for local governments is actually in January. Yeah especially for the capital, for the capital investment, mm. like roads, water, etc. So they have six months mm. to be able to use. So we raise money in July, in October, and then the last release. So instead of raising money, they also release in April yeah. for the local government, we release in January. And mm. we have done this consistently, yeah. you know, for definitely the last five years or so. And we think it has actually worked. So once we do that, mm. we engage now the different media, you know, uh, channels yeah. to ensure that this information goes down the local communities. And actually, we have actually seen, uh, for example, there's a time we did uh, uh, send out information uh, for pensioners yes. who are scattered. Yeah. Because it, we had a huge problem, mm. you know, of uh, either pensioners not being paid the, their pension, not arriving on time, mm. some being deleted from the payroll. So we actually printed information in the media, and then we also sent it down, you know, and we asked, we, we, we actually directed, yeah. you know, all government offices at the role level to pin that information. But the amount of interest it generated, mm. here it was evident mm. that, that if, you people, if you communicate, mm. if you send information, the impact will be great. Mm. And I can actually tell you now, over the years, we have practically eliminated all pension areas. We just have residual pension areas. But yeah. because of that consistency, both in releasing the money, but mm. also ensuring that as much as possible, we avail information mm. to people. Because at the end of the day, it goes back to the thing you have, actually, the role of the citizen. Absolutely. You see, the citizen is the one who pays the taxes. Mm. Okay? He's, he's actually the one who has paid the taxes, but at the same time, he's a beneficiary of the services that the government is, 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 is uh, delivering. Yeah. So in order for this guy, you know, to demand for the services, he needs to have he needs information. To know. Uh. He needs to know. Mm. So that he's able to demand for information. And uh, if you look at uh, countries, you know, the, the higher income countries, yeah. there's, because there's much more citizen engagement mm. because of uh, the, the level of awareness, the level of literacy. Yeah. So that is built, of course, over a period of time. Mm. But in our circumstances as well, you know, we try to use, you know, whatever channels we have to ensure that people can get this information. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much on the information. Um, viewers, when you come to listen to a budget discussion, you're thinking they're going through at me numbers. You see we're discussing numbers but in context with you. Today we are showing you how you matter. You pay the taxes, you matter. Things you should know. I don't think we shall finish these things everywhere, but hopefully uh, CS Bag and Minister of Finance can continue to delve deeper into uh, the things that you should know that pertain to you so that the budget becomes yours as a citizen. We are coming back after the break. Please, don't, uh, please join us after the break. to the <coughs> this discussion, special discussion, part of um, the budget month, and uh, every year, uh, Minister of Finance with partners like uh, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group uh, come together uh, to conduct the budget month and a series of activities which are designed to help you, the citizen, and improve transparency. And as far as the budget is concerned, including awareness, we hope we are contributing to a practical awareness of this budget uh, for next financial year. Uh, in the studio again, I'll introduce my, in case you're just joining us, I'll introduce uh, 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 my guests. Uh, on my immediate left is uh, Mr. Julius Mukunda, Executive Director for the CS Bag, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group. And on his uh, left there is uh, Mr. Kenneth Mugambe, Director, Budget Minister of Finance and Economic Development, Planning and Economic Development. And lastly, Mr. Dennis Kato, manager in charge of projects uh, from the Uganda Revenue Authority. And we are discussing the budget theme, the budget month theme. How is the budget shaping up the role of the citizen in the budget process? 
Do you know your role? We have been discussing that in the last hour. And now we are going to move on to more practical things again. Um, let me start with Kenneth again. Program-based budgeting. I encountered it at some point, let me see, probably April for me, April uh, 2021. What are we talking about? Suddenly there's parish and now there's PBB. <laughs> Program-based budgeting. What is this animal? Okay. <coughs> First of all, there, there is no contradiction mm. uh, between uh, what I talked about earlier, the parish model, and program-based budgeting. Uh, program-based budgeting is a budgeting concept yeah. uh, which looks at uh, the relationship between a set of interventions that deliver a common objective mm. and the money that is allocated for those interventions. And the reason why we have decided to move that route uh, yeah. is because we discovered, we found that, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, disjointed planning and budgeting. Mm. Uh, because if you think of, uh, uh, think of an, an activity, uh, an objective like, say, improving nutrition mm. uh, or even sanitation, mm. uh, in nutrition, improving nutrition is not just a function of health, actually. No. It, is a, it has a function of health, it has a, uh, dimensions of water, mm. it has dimensions of education and agriculture. So to be, and, and agriculture. Yeah. So to be able to address the nutrition of a community or a country mm. or the sanitation, you need to ensure that uh, you bring all these institutions mm. who have a role in delivering nutrition. Because each institution you realize actually has you know, different roles actually that they play in, in, in as far as this nutrition as an example is concerned. Yeah. So that becomes more or less like a program. So that is how the concept of a program came about. Mm -hmm. Now in the past, uh, of course uh, our budget has evolved over the years. Mm. The traditional way we were budgeting uh, right from the colonial times until a few years back, yeah. uh, we were just simply looking at inputs. So if you, like uh, Julius talked about our budget book, yeah. uh, if a citizen or anybody picked a budget book, all you would actually see we are the expenditure items. Mm. Now expenditure items are essentially inputs which are expected to help you to deliver outputs. Mm. But in at that time we do not even show the citizens what outputs what will will happen. What will happen? Mm. What are they getting? Mm. But we would simply show them the inputs, what we are going to be doing. So we changed that yeah. and uh, started uh, linking those inputs to outputs. Expected outputs. Expected outputs. Mm. Now what are the expected outputs? Expected outputs would be, for example, the number of teachers who have been recruited, mm. if you are talking of the budget of education, okay? The number of pupils who are in school, yeah. the number of textbooks which you have bought, mm. the number of classrooms which you have constructed, okay. it is, those are outputs, outputs. of the budget. Mm. But you realize that uh, the development needs of a country are simply beyond the number of teachers yes. who have been recruited. Yeah. Or even the number of pupils, yes. because you can actually monitor, you can, yes, you can uh, say many pupils are in school, mm. but so probably they are not attending, yeah. or they are not actually get, getting the education that you need. Mm. So that's why we decided to move a step higher now, to start monitoring yeah. the outcomes of the education system. Mm. So in addition to looking at how many schools we have constructed, yeah. you know, how many teachers have been uh, recruited, mm. how many pupils are attending, now we start looking at the uh, outcomes, as we call it. Yeah. You know, how many people, for example, have passed primary seven? Mm. So you start now, yeah. you know, you, you start uh, uh, a measurement. Uh, measuring yeah. performance mm. uh, in terms of those high level outcomes. You know, how many, as I said, how many people are passing? Yeah. Mm. How many are transiting yeah. from primary five mm. to primary seven? Mm. Because actually, on paper, you might be having. But many, many, many of these are not transitioning. And yeah, they're dropping they out. They are dropping out of yeah. school. They are repeating uh, ETC. Mm. So that's really, not in a nutshell, why we decided to move towards program budgeting. Mm. So that we look at planning and budgeting, bringing together all these institutions, mm. which have a common interest in delivering a particular result. Yeah. So we get all those resources, in a, in a way, put them in, in a pool. Cluster. Mm. Yes, we, mm. you, you have the program areas. So we have actually come up with 20 program areas and mm. these are in the national development plan mm. and they are linked to the objective the ultimate objectives of the national development plan mm. and we believe that uh, uh, if we all focus our efforts on this program budgeting yeah. we should be definitely able to achieve 
you know, better results than we have been getting. Because there will be joint planning, there will be better planning. Mm. So instead of people looking at individual ministries and institutions, mm. they will now be looking at the higher level out, uh, mm. you know, outcome. Yeah. You know, what are we getting out of this? Mm. Is the literacy improving? Is, uh, for example, if you are talking about agriculture, is there value? Add are we adding value? Mm. So because it's not just, uh, for example, delivering the inputs. Yeah. Because as you realized, we, re we, we delivered agriculture planting materials. Mm. But are these planting materials at the end of the day helping you to improve production? Acreage. So, yeah, exactly. Mm. But are you also increasing the productivity? Income. The, the, of course, that material, the income mm. of the farmer. So those are now the things that we are looking at as far as program budgeting is concerned. Okay. Yes. Julius, I saw you... Um, you're whispering something as to yourself as uh, <coughs> Kenneth was explaining. Are we on point? I, I think that's 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 has been our, our biggest missing link. Mm. That while they are fighting for how many desks do I have, how many teachers do I have? I mean, they are important. Yeah. You know, how many students are we given farmers? Mm. Forgetting that there is something more than that that we want, mm. because as a farmer, among the things is that if you give the seedlings, there is a, it's not a seedling. There is something expecting beyond the seedling. Absolutely. And that the farmer, for example, mm. if he's going to plant, he must make sure probably does he have the right the right seedling. Mm. That's 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 very important. And will this seedling grow? If it grows, what is going to get out of it? Where will I sell? Where are you mm. going to sell? Mm. So and, uh, and, and now you find that agriculture probably is not involved in the trade, for example. Mm. Trade. So now the program approach is like, there should be some component of how agriculture is going to trade and sell its component. Mm. So it has been a very biggest, our biggest missing link. S departments were, you know, acting in, in silos, as if there are different small government or different sectors. Yeah. To the extent that you find that if you are in agriculture, you also want to ensure that you do the trade, you do the certifications, you construct roads, you bring it. somebody else is doing the same thing elsewhere. But somebody else mm. is doing it, and they have got even a better expertise than mm. you. So it's a question of saying that agriculture, if these are our needs for us to have our farmer deliver, mm. improve productivity, yeah. we need electricity. We need community roads. We need information on, on trade, on mm -hmm. prices. We need to train them uh, better. So what do you need to do? So you make sure that there is a component of education. Yeah. The, the, the works people, in uh, the transport people know about it. The roads people know about it. Mm -hmm. The electricity people, uh, energy, mm -hmm. are about it. Because if you're going to have value addition and yeah. you need some kind of maize meal, then there must be a program that can deliver uh, power, power mm -hmm. to, 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 uh, to, to, the, to the maize meal. So. Mm -hmm. That combination can enable us now to say, yes, once we produce the maize, yeah. we can add value addition. We can, by, you know, by passing through the maize meal, we can also ensure that they are satisfied. Mm -hmm. Now UNBS comes in. So you can see that kind of, mm. of, of combination that comes in. Of course, I mean, there's a challenge now, of course, of bringing everybody together. But I think everything has got to start. Mm. And, and I think for me it's a very good start that, yes, we have a good, we should be able to get on board. Yeah. You definitely find individual like, oh, oh, this is still my thing, I can't give it out. Mm. But I, I know towards the end you'll find out that, you know, you need this is the where the government yeah. is heading. Yeah. You will need the other person to support you to deliver, mm. on, your, on, to deliver on, your, on, on your mandate. Okay. And, and as such, I think it's a very, it's a very good move. Uh, it's very complicated. I, a few things I have seen, it's <laughs> so complicated, <laughs> especially with their systems of integrating them and the rest. Mm. But I think it's a very good move. We should all support it and ensure that we, 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 we deliver uh, on, on what we want as, as, as a country. Mr. Gato, does uh, PBB, Program-Based Budgeting, make your work easier? Do you see any strand in that approach? that's going to make URA's work easier, <laughs> especially <laughs> at the front end, <laughs> because you are the receiving end of the fire. Yes. Mm. Um, thank you, sir. Um, when we talk about PBB yeah. and all the 18 programs mm. under there, you are a uh, contribute to, the, uh, to one of the, the major program, uh, that is the DPI. Yeah. DP, please break down those people are wondering why now they're talking to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's the development plan implementation, okay. sorry. Development um, plan implementation. Yes. Mm. And therein is where the, the big mass of uh, the weight of URA goes. Mm. That we are on top of what uh, government is getting from other sources uh, for, for to develop and uh, implement the budget. Yeah. We are targeted to be the ultimate source mm. 
of uh, the, the, the resources that come in to fund yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the PBB programs, mm. okay? And so it, it, it makes our work uh, easier, mm. but again, it is a pointer to many other arms of government mm. that in as much as we are running with our different activities under the programs, uh, there is need for URA to be uh, present, to be informed. If there is need for interfaces for systems, mm. when URA comes up with the certain proposals, we expect that uh, uh, the government arms support because URA really thrives on data. Yeah. Some of these, uh, some of the systems in the different uh, MDS, uh, mm. sorry, in the different agencies of, of government, really churn of data, and some of this data is tax implementing. Mm. Uh, URA needs to be in the know of that. And so what we expect uh, in this DPP, as we are at, at the top of looking for the resources, yeah. is the, 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 um, uh, the ability for the different arms of government not to look at uh, the different programs selfishly, mm. but at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you cannot put in and expect that where you're picking from is empty. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when, when, when Ken talked about, um, when he talked about the the, uh, the, par the parish model, yeah. money is going out up to the parish. The people out there need to know that at the end of the day, mm. in the short term, in the medium term, some businesses will have developed mm. and URA will be coming closer. <laughs> Our coming closer. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yes, obviously. Our coming closer is, first of all, to teach you, mm. engage you, let you know that as you develop in, uh, that you develop in business, yeah. there is also this is the time that your patriotism mm -hmm. as a Ugandan mm -hmm. should be felt. And the first state of patriotism for Ugandan out there is how do you support government? Mm -hmm. And that is in the paying mm -hmm. of taxes. taxes. One of them is paying of taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, the citizen out there needs to know that uh, in all that government is doing through the different programs, the ultimate mm -hmm. is that citizen. Okay, but at the end of the day, the government is also looking at you, the citizen, yeah. who's benefiting from the different uh, programs of government to see how to contribute mm. to the development of this nation. And that can, makes can sense. I add yes, uh, can uh, go uh, ahead. Yeah, the, the point I wanted to add to what he's saying, mm. you see, the, the ultimate objective of uh, program budgeting is to improve service delivery, mm. is to create an efficient system of allocating money and uh, ensuring that we get we, we improve efficiency mm. in, w in the way the services are delivered. And I believe that uh, once services are delivered and the citizens appreciate the services, yeah. then it will actually make the work of URI easier. easier. Exactly. Because now the citizens mm. will be able to understand where their resources are going. Mm, yeah. So it will be easy for government to account for their resources. And of course, uh, uh, it will also be easy mm. for URA to get additional taxes yeah. from the citizens because they can actually we can we can demonstrate mm. you know where these resources everything is and that outputs. has been a, mm. a challenge actually mm. in some cases where citizens kind of say okay yes you're asking us to pay you know these taxes but what are we getting out of these taxes so the ultimate objective mm. of this program is to improve service delivery and you cannot have services of course without revenue yes and that's how you are definitely will, will, will come in okay. so we believe that uh, the there's a lot of complementarity actually mm. yes. in having PBB to deliver services yeah. and then of course making the work of URI easier yeah. because the citizens will be able to appreciate the services they are getting out of their taxes. And it makes sense. I was yeah. listening to the CG the other day uh, yesterday but when he was saying uh, URI henceforth is going to be based on um, information based decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And say NITA has information, NIRA has information, they can work together, maybe in that cluster, to make sure that they spot, if it is a tax-based question, mm. to spot who is supposed to pay and they have evidence. I'll say, but, but guy, you need to pay your taxes because it's No, I mean, work, work permits here. I mm. mean, I mean uh, I, it would, should be easier for URA to access the immigration services yes. and how many work, foreign work permits are there mm. and whether actually these guys are paying the right amount of taxes. I mean, yes. it's one government. Yeah. Why should it definitely be that you have a department, there is another, you know, there is another department. Mm. Of course, I understand there are some protocols that you go through, but still it's one government, yeah. one common objective. They want to collect taxes and somebody is declaring, please, mm. you can fix it out. And I hope EBB does fix that. Yeah. Okay, very well. Um, I was looking at one of the under program-based budgeting. I was seeing one of the biggest animals, let me call them, that, that took out of money is human, human capital development. Mm. Yes. 
by way of illustration, Kenneth, let's break that down. What is that? It's taking most money in the budget. Yes, yes. What is under the program Human Capital Development? Who is there? <laughs> Human Capital Development is essentially a clustering of uh, institutions which directly contribute mm. to human capital. Uh, and this is uh, largely institutions uh, like health, you know, education, mm. you know, which are, of course, the common ones that we all know. Yeah. But, of course, institutions like gender, mm -hmm. as far as they contribute, uh, you mm. know, uh, to mindset change, like yeah. you talked about, mm. uh, which is part of uh, human capital development, mm. uh, issues to do with skilling, uh, of course, improve the literacy, mm. uh, which is education, as I said. So th those are the institutions which constitute the program called human capital development. Okay. So the objective is uh, when these institutions are planning, all those institutions, mm. they must have an ultimate objective, which is to improve the person, yes. the human Ugandan, being. the human mm. being, mm. in terms of uh, his well-being, in terms of his well-being, mm. whether, it, whether it is in terms of his health, because as you know, uh, I mean, if you're healthy but uh, you eat it, I, I think you are very. You are, I don't think you are we very useful, problems. actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the whole point of <laughs> exactly, and vice versa, of course. Mm. Because mm. <laughs> if you are literate and uh, and you are unhealthy, yeah. still it doesn't actually help in terms mm. of contributing to national development. So mm. that's what the whole essence. Mm. To ensure that this individual uh, <laughs> called Samuel Setumba, yeah. that the government of Uganda is planning for, mm. is a balanced individual. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he develops as a balanced individual. He has the re relevant uh, literacy, yeah. but he's also healthy and mm. he has all these other aspects mm. okay of uh, a human being mm. which contributes his uh, you know uh, overall well-being okay. so in a nutshell uh, put it simply actually that's what it means actually mm. yes so we are looking at those institutions that contribute uh, the bulk of them as i said being uh, health education water mm. gender mm. Uh, it is and, and then i think it brings it well to say you know you are all planning for this human being yeah what imp what the of what importance is for you to concentrate on on only health and you forget about education because yeah. at the end of the day an individual must contribute to the development of themselves mm. but also to the country mm. so th that's why that's when you hear if there is a pandemic for example yeah. and you hear that oh uh, the country's growth might be hampered Affected. simply because people are not working mm. either they are sick yeah even if they are not sick, they are not delivering. We saw the lockdown here. Yeah. I mean, you, you, mm. you, you know, you, you saw the lockdown. And mm. I think for me, that's the, the t a very good take for example what program budgeting is all about. Yeah. So let's ensure that these institutions under these programs mm. speak to each other. Mm. On the same issues. On, on the same issues. To the level that if you have a, if you have a primary school P1, mm. One is, are these children, are they immunized? You see, that, that's, that, exactly. that's, that's something that people we shouldn't do. So are edu they education is mind with, with the health on immunization. Yes. Yes. So yes. that education says, I have children who are not immunized. Mm. They might not finish P6 or P5. Mm. That's, that, that's, that's very important. And also, the Ministry of, of Health is like, I think our mothers, yeah. because we know very well that women who have a higher level of education, mm tend actually to attend more antenatal care than others. Absolutely. They mind so much more about their reproductive health. Yeah. That, uh, my, that, they, 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 that we, we, we don't have underage uh, girls who are pregnant, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. because most of them are in school. Mm -hmm. So please education ensure that children stay in school. Yeah. The mindset people would always be saying that parents, please, you must keep your children in school mm -hmm. instead of harvesting cotton or maize or millet or some, yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. in, in, in their village. So. I think for me is if we can effectively have that, it's it's a challenge, but I think we can really do it. That yeah. we all deliver as one to this human being, so that they go in primary school, they immunized, they attend, they you know they they have the right teachers. That's mm -hmm. very very important. That actually at the end of the day, that when the person you say he's going to construct, is is a supervisor for mm -hmm. your building, you know, yes, you can go and see and and sleep, but knowing that somebody really did the shortcut, mm. didn't go to school, probably the certificate is the, 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 the institutions they went to was mm. not as good as it's supposed to be, then we have a problem. Before we leave PBB, program-based budgeting, I saw the other one and I, I'm looking for opportunities. The citizen is listening and saying, okay, I think this guy is on the point. Agro-industrialization for me is a passion. It's the, I think, number four mm. or number five there. Mm. Uh, where is the opportunity in merging everybody doing agro-industrialization. I know it began um, 
two financial years ago, I think, we were talking about agro-industrialization in the theme. And now we, it's, it, it's become a program of its own. Where are the opportunities? Maybe let me go to Kenneth. Where are the opportunities that mm. a citizen who is listening should say, okay, I should go there? Okay, before the opportunities, first of all, because the Ugandan economy is an agro-based uh, economy. Mm, absolutely. Uh, one key sector, or oh, to use the word sector again, uh, is agriculture. Mm. Okay? But to be able to generate all the benefits of agriculture, mm. you need to look at the entire agricultural value chain. Value chain. And that's why we have, uh, you know, come up with that program called agro-industrialization. Mm. Because the overall objective is to ensure that uh, we add value to the agricultural products that mm. we produce. So that we do not continue selling, you know, like we do, largely, raw stuff. you know, raw materials, mm. uh, you know, uh, wh which of course we know, if mm. we added value, mm. we will be able to create more employment. Of course, we would increase the value of the products, yeah. you know, and much more uh, foreign currency, mm. uh, ETC. So that's the whole essence of the agro-industrialization, mm. you know, program. So the agro-industrialization program is looking at the entire agricultural value chain, as I said, right from agricultural research mm. to ensure that whatever NARO, for example, does, if NARO comes up with a research in an improved crop variety, yeah. okay, this crop variety, of course, mm. will end up with farmers, which will help the farmers to produce more. Yeah. Whatever the farmers have produced, value is added by way of, uh, you know, industrialization. Mm. And then, of course, ultimately, we either consume them and whatever we cannot consume, you know, we export. So I think in terms of uh, how the ordinary person comes, you know, takes advantage. Mm, especially that sector is, uh, for me, it's very critical, that uh, program. Uh, no, no, uh, absolutely. Mm. Because related to agro-industrialization uh, uh, as a program, we are looking at, uh, 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 looking at agriculture from uh, enhancing the linkage between farmers mm. and processors. Yeah. And I think I will use the example of, uh, uh, if you take the example of oil palm mm -hmm. in Karangara, mm -hmm. uh, essentially what has happened is government came up and yeah. patterned with a private uh, investor. Mm -hmm. Government gave land mm -hmm. to the private investor, yeah. and in addition we give planting materials mm -hmm. to the outgrowers. Yeah. So what the private investor has done is put up the processing facility. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, the outgrowers, the individual farmers, yeah. are guaranteed of a market mm. at a good price. And then, of course, the processor is also guaranteed, mm. you know, of the raw material to be able to add value to the raw material. Which yeah. So by doing that, you enhance the synergies, ecosystem. Mm. the synergies between, mm. you know, the producers and <laughs> the processors. Mm. So the farmers, uh, depending, of course, on the nature of their crop, yeah. would take advantage of that, that kind of relationship mm. to ensure that they produce more. And, of course, by producing more, then their incomes will definitely increase because yeah. they are guaranteed of a market. Mm. And of course, good uh, agro, agronomy, agro, agro, uh, agricultural practices. Okay. Uh, extension workers, the planting materials themselves, the fertilizers, etc. Okay. And that's how we'd expect the farmers to come in. Okay, thank you for benefit. highlighting that. Yes. Uh, we need to get off uh, PBB for the world. And clearly, Kenneth and uh, Julius and Mr. Kato there, you have to drive education on, on program based budgeting. Mm. Because it sounds complicated, but it's very practical. Julia said complicated. Yes, I know. In terms of human beings, the technical, technical people. But in terms of the citizen, it is not as complicated mm. as it is. Mm. Yes. And yeah, so people need to know that there's this thing. It's not just, just their new thing. Yes. It's something I can harness from there. They need to understand that. So again, going back to education. Mm. Yes. It's very critical as we go. Exactly. For me, I think it will succeed. Now I want to move on to, um, again, about the citizen. I saw that um, domestic areas, uh, where people, the demand is over a trillion, and now we have, uh, it's about 400 billion yes. in this financial year. Yes. People ask, why does the government like paying us our <laughs> money? <laughs> you know, why, why does it, why does it pay us our money, yes. our debts, our, <laughs> what they owe us, and then we develop? Yes. Okay, it's so, a so, so perception. Yes. From the citizen. Yes. No, no, I think that's, that's true. Yes. The government has a date, let them pay. And now it is uh, true <laughs> that uh, we have areas, yeah. uh, but if you look at the trend, uh, the, 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 there has been a change mm. in the way these areas actually have been accumulated. 
10 years ago or maybe before 10 years ago the bulk of the areas would be in terms of people who have supplied the government yeah, supplies. direct supplies exactly mm. the small trader on Nkrumah road mm. uh, who would have supplied the government maybe stationary or the garage where government has repaired the vehicle mm. or uh, where they have consumed fuel and this person has not paid yeah at some point, the bulk of the areas were for utilities, actually. Mm. The, the money which we owe, government has consumed electricity, they have consumed water, yeah. and they are not paid. Mm. That has changed now. So those ones now constitute less than 10% of our stock of the domestic areas. Okay. Now, in terms of utilities, we have largely implemented prepayment systems. Mm. So people consume what they can afford pay to pay for. for. Mm. Okay? Just like in the private sector, mm. and in, like in our households, of Yaka. course. Yaka, exactly. Mm. Uh, so we have done that successfully for electricity and some extent, of course, uh, for water. Yeah. Now, what has remained, uh, and which is, uh, I'll come back to what we are doing to fight it, yeah. uh, areas which are largely arising out of uh, uh, decisions that were made some time back, mm. uh, either on the government acquiring people's land yeah. and uh, has not paid. Mm. Uh, this is largely common in the... Uh, uh, Western Uganda, yeah. uh, where the ranches were restructured and mm. government has not paid. Mm. In the case of quota wards, yeah. where in some yes, cases, mm. in some uh, cases, uh, contracts are mismanaged, mm. people end up going to court. Yeah. Uh, we used to have a lot of areas on pension mm. uh, because, again, of, of what I described earlier on, because we are not paying the pensioners on time, mm. and they would keep accumulating areas. So now that is what we are looking at. So yeah. we are looking at uh, how do we address the remaining areas. So as I said, at least the what comforts us is that. Uh, the previous type of areas mm. which were impacting you know on the businesses have to some extent actually been minimized because yeah. that was a big problem because mm. if you don't pay a business then of course you're looking my money yeah, my I'm, not, I'm not only looking your money mm. but of course the business will actually collapse yeah yeah in their own ground and mm. of course once it corrupts it has a lot of negative implications on the, Mr. Kadoda and you the, right. the, the taxes mm. will not come mm. uh, the people who are depending on the business the whole chain of uh, you know uh, people who are depending on that business. Mm. So we are coming up uh, in the coming budget with <laughs> a domestic areas strategy. Okay. Now the strategy is two-pronged. One, mm -hmm. we are looking at uh, a strategy on how to clear what has already been accumulated. Yeah. Yeah. Because we cannot do away with it. It has mm -hmm. been accumulated. We have undertaken an audit. So we are going to ensure that that is clear. Yeah. Then going forward, mm -hmm. we want to put in place very stringent conditions mm. to on ensure that we do not accumulate yeah. more areas. Mm. Because as long as you accumulate more than you are clearing, then you are not solving mm. the problem. So that two-pronged strategy is going to be to come into effect yeah. uh, in the budget of the coming year, mm. July 1st, which is actually next month, exactly next month. Mm. So starting from July, we are going to vigorously implement that domestic areas strategy. We have already discussed it with uh, many of the key stakeholders. Yeah. So we are going to engage uh, all the accounting officers and actually put in place sanctions mm. uh, for non-compliance. So we are going to tighten our controls yeah. uh, in the system to mm -hmm. ensure that people do not accumulate areas. One of the other aspects were which where, which, uh, where we accumulated a lot of areas was our contributions to international organizations. Yes. Yeah. Now Uganda subscribes to many international organizations. Mm. So we have undertaken a study and uh, looked at uh, the pros and cons <laughs> of belonging to these international Being organizations. <laughs> and you'll actually be surprised. Mm. In some cases, some of the institutions yeah. which subscribe the organizations were not aware that they were subscribing, <laughs> <laughs> subscribing to these organizations. <laughs> so meaning mm. they were not <laughs> deriving any benefits actually mm. from these institutions. So we have looked at the benefits, you know, the costs and the benefits we are the of being members of these organizations. So yeah. we have prepared a paper mm. which hopefully the cabinet will consider mm. yeah. and approve. So once yeah. that paper again is you know, approved by cabinet, yeah. it will constitute part of our strategy. Because it will help us mm. to eliminate those organizations where we do not see much benefit uh, coming from. Yeah. So that we can only remain organizations where we are getting benefits, mm. but at the same time we are able to sustainably, you know, meet yeah. their contributions. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course there is already a, cri a, cri a, cri a criteria we are using mm. to be able to come up with those costs and benefits. Okay. Yeah. I Very I interesting. Uh, before, uh, <laughs> Julius, before we leave the area, mm. there's a different type of area. <laughs> <laughs> From Mr. Kato there. Yes. We are speaking exactly. about the <laughs> yes. Speak about what you're doing as you are uh, on your type of area. <laughs> yeah. yeah <but> For businesses. <laughs> yes. Uh, on our ta ta type of area, mm. uh, first of all, we have certain uh, programs yes. uh, which are running. Because we don't want to engage uh, a taxpayer to a point where 
we even um, issue out administrative assessments, mm. and then the, the tax is so Ganesh, huge. Ganesh what? There's they something they call it. Very interesting. <laughs> I heard it. Mm. Like. Yes. Ganesh order. Ganesh yes. order. Mm. Mm. And then the person, uh, mm. just by the nature of the business, yeah. or at what level the business is, yeah. can actually not meet those taxes. Mm. So we have a program of, uh, of uh, voluntary disclosure. Yeah. We're encouraging people, taxpayers, those registered and non-registered, mm. if they have been card, uh, uh, an incidence of tax, mm. but they have not declared in full, or they have totally hidden away, come clean to URA. Yeah. Declare. Don't wait for URA to initiate an activity on you, and then uh, uh, issue um, assessments. Mm. And, and then you fail to pay. We are accumulating arrears, and yet, you know, these are legal, mm. and you're also failing to pay. So we have some of these programs. But also on, on top of that, we are ensuring that even what is existing, yeah. we are coming up with uh, with modalities. Uh, URA is uh, is client centric. Mm. Yes, we 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 we, we have uh, we have instruments of yeah. the taxpayer can come and enter an agreement, be able to spread his tax and pay over a period of time. Mm. You know, and and uh, and the management is very strong on that. Okay. Yes. So w we have uh, those those strategies. Our our intention is that we we come up with tax that is collectible. Uh, and yes. before I leave you, um, I know and I saw it in the budget paper. Yes. Uh, two things actually. There's one: if you have by mistake realized that you um, made a mistake, instead of giving you one year to clean up, it's three years now. And then there's another issue of alternative dispute res resolution outside the tribunal mm. and court. Mm. Speak about that, because budget and citizen. Yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Now, these are, uh, that is part of the, um, the, the, the activities we're coming up with to make sure that the citizen feel they are part of the process mm. of revenue mobilization domestically. Okay, so uh, that is one of the things that you are, uh, has come up with yeah. to make sure that we, 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 don't, we don't run you down. Mm. Okay, the, the, the legal process is there, the standards are there, yeah. but we also have a certain room where we can accommodate a taxpayer who is struggling. We see eye to eye. Yes. Mm. So it is in that regard uh, that this is coming up. Okay, very well. Mm. Uh, still sticking with the citizen, uh, earlier Julius talked about the local government being the, the mm. one to engage mm. uh, at, at that level for the citizen. Mm. I noticed that the local government allocation overall is, looks like big, but there's the principle of 4.6 trillion, if I'm correct, for mm. local government mm. altogether. But I noticed that uh, <coughs> the local governments want to collect their money in the municipalities and, and the parishes and keep it. Minister of Finance is saying, uh -uh, you collect, you send to us, and then we give you some of it all. <laughs> we, we <can laughs> no, <submit. it's laughs> Why does government want to collect and give <laughs> instead of them? <laughs> Maybe, sorry, sorry um, uh, Kenneth, but this is, these are the but big but animals you have to talk about. <laughs> some, some have something so okay. small, so okay. small on, on, on the areas. Okay, let's go I think there's something which, which, which I think we need to face, yes. which, is, I, which we need to face and talk about, and that is fiscal discipline. I was coming to that yes, issue, but go on. Uh, because for me, it really is, I know that when Kenneth is writing his budget code circulars, mm. one of the things they emphasize, please, don't commit government if you have not budget for it, if you don't, have, if you don't mm. have money, mm. very well, sp uh, even in the board. But accounting, we still go ahead and do that. Mm. And, and, and I think for me, we need to do something, we need some kind of discipline in terms of that, that if you do it, something must happen to you. The other part also is, uh, is, is corruption. Mm. You know, uh, areas are increased simply because a small plot that was very supposed to at the market price is one million in Uganda, it mm. can be a billion. Mm. And there's nobody who's going to control, about, to control that. Mm. So, Probably we need a, either a system of a price list from public procurement to sort and say, please, these are the market prices mm. for all these things. You know, a pen can even cost more than the market price. Yeah, I remember the issue of the pens. Yes. Mm. So can we have a price list and say, probably this is what government will buy and this, mm. should, be, this should be the price. And it's possible. And, and, and I think for me, to, and it is possible. Mm. So I think as part of the strategy, I think that's something we, need, we really need to, to, to look at, that mm. this issue of fiscal discipline by the accounting officers. I mean, when you talked about subscriptions, there are even subscri subscriptions mm -hmm. whereby it is you and an individual, but the government is paying for you. Can you Simply because you're not even, you, you do, you're not aware about mm. it. Yes. So okay, very interesting. Mm. And uh, we shall, at the tail end, we shall come back to fiscal discipline. But let's come back to uh, Kenneth. Local governments mm. want to collect, but you are saying collect, you send, then we, give, we send you back. Why that mm. zigzag? 
Uh, first of all, the major law that manages public resources is yeah. the Public Finance Management Act. Absolutely. Now, according to the Public Finance Management Act of 2015, mm. all resources are expected to go to the consolidated fund. Mm. So that's the ultimate, and that's the objective, mm. actually. So we, do not, uh, we don't have any intention, or in any way do we get this money and we don't send it back. Yeah. Actually, in most cases, if you look, we give him more money because actually we advance him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, the way the system That's works. So because mm -hmm. on day one, which mm -hmm. is July, yeah. these rural governments have not collected they any don't money. Have money. They haven't collected, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Just like us, actually. <laughs> you already haven't collected. Yeah. So <laughs> we have a way of getting our advances. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the local governments, we advance on account of what we have budgeted for, mm -hmm. for each individual rural government that's coming from local revenue, we advance them in yeah. quarter one. Yeah. Then, of course, from quarter one, they start collecting the mm. money. And then when they collect, we start deducting what they we discount. advanced. Uh. Then, of course, also sending back what they have collected. If they overcorrect, yeah. then actually we give back the, the money they have overcorrected. But, of course, naturally, and, and uh, this is based on the, as I said, based on the law, because mm. we need to appropriate this money. So the only way we can get all these resources yeah. is to ensure that the resources are in the consolidated Basket. fund. They, they, mm. are passing, uh, they are in the budget, passed by parliament, mm. appropriated. And then, of course, they come to the consolidated fund, and then we send them. Yeah. I think for me, the question that uh, rural government should be asking us is whether we send this, ma whether we send back the money, as they have collected it, yeah. and whether we send it timely. Mm. And definitely, I can guarantee that we send back the money 100%, yeah. and we send it timely. Mm. So we, on our side as Minister of Finance, we, we, we do not actually think there is any major reason mm. why the local government should be complaining. As long as we send back their money and we send it in time. So if they collect it, all of it, you give? We give them back whatever they collect, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. But we need to ensure that all these resources are properly documented and yeah. accounted for. Mm. And of course, in line with the law. Okay. Yes. You just talked about uh, the issue of fiscal indiscipline at, the, at that level of the accounting officers. Last time I had with Minister of Finance, I think it was an interview with uh, uh, Keith Mwakanis, mm. there was that punitive thing on those guys. Mm. What has happened now? You know, it, there's a lot that happens, actually. The, uh, one of the Im Im immediate uh, instruments mm. that finance has, which is in their law, yeah. is the appointment of accounting officers. Mm. Mm. So the law now is very clear. Any accounting officer who has not accounted for public resources mm. Okay, financial or physical assets yeah. cannot be accounted because the Secretary of the Treasury is the one who appoints accounting officers. That's true. So in every financial year, mm. uh, if you want, I can actually give you the statistics over the years, how many accounting officers we have actually stopped mm. from being accounting officers on account of, you know, uh, poor accountability, non-compliance uh, non mm. with mm. the law ETC. Mm. Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, I, I think uh, like in a developing country, yeah. You see, we still have challenges of fiscal discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think it is uh, incumbent on all of us. Uh, and that's why actually your theme is good, because mm -hmm. even fiscal discipline go goes back to the role of the, of the citizen. Mm -hmm. Because we are not talking about fiscal discipline actually necessarily, not just uh, at the level of the central government accounting officer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, no, it should cascade downwards. Something it should cascade true. downwards now to, to the, the cow, mm -hmm. even to the parish. Uh, now. Yeah. Because now that we are sending resources to the parish, mm -hmm. okay, where probably the Minister of Finance is not reaching, mm -hmm the citizen should be able to bring up these issues mm. okay these resources came you know for the revolving fund yeah. but actually they have not been used for the revolving fund mm. so once that information comes then of course finance would be enabled to take action yeah. to ensure that the person who is uh, you know uh, not complying mm. uh, is uh, sanctioned okay yes very good um we want to use our time uh, well w uh, we are left with about 10 minutes or, or, or thereabout um is the decision to slow down on the appetite and trajectory for expenditure, and that I'm thinking about debt, up to you, Minister of Finance, or oh, it's up to somebody else? Does Minister of Finance, can it apply the brakes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of course, the Minister of Finance uh, does not work in isolation of the mm. rest of the government. Yeah. Uh, Minister of Finance works, uh, is part of the overall government. Yeah. But the, the good thing is that uh, particularly the, the main message which comes from the political leaders, mm. from His Excellency the President, yes. is that we need to ensure that our debt is sustainable. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why actually if you compare our dates to many of these other countries, mm. other than Tanzania, in mm. the region actually we are the second lowest. Second okay. lowest yeah. okay. Only Tanzania beats us. Mm. So we actually are doing well. So of course there has been talk uh, that uh, our debt is not sustainable, uh, that the debt is... If you exclude the two years where we were hit by COVID, mm. which is 1920 and 2021, yeah. we were doing very, very well. Now in 1920, financial year 2019 and 2020, 2021, which is the current financial year, yeah. of course we were hit by two problems. Mm. One, the revenues go went, went down. In those two years, actually combined, mm. we are almost going to have a revenue shortfall of five trillion shillings yeah. in the two financial years combined. So the question now was, yeah. given the circumstances we are in, do you simply cut expenditure mm. and then, of course, uh, most likely get into a recession mm. with all <laughs> the mm. consequences that yeah. come with a recession? Pull out the money or and nothing exactly, happens. Or, or do you borrow? Mm and ensure that you are able to spend. Because on the one hand, we needed to provide, uh, to, to maintain some degree of services mm. that we are maintaining, either in health, which are COVID-related, yeah. or these social programs, distribution mm. of food, mm. etc. Mm. But at the same time, we had to borrow yeah. to ensure that we meet the revenue gap. Because if we didn't do that, then even the little, actually, the little growth that we, go, we got would have been wiped would out. Would have been wiped out by that. Mm. So that is actually, those are the two financial years which have destabilized our debt ratios. Mm. So we believe that uh, going forward, because as we speak now, yeah. we are almost at a threshold, which is about 50% mm. debt to GDP. But going forward, yeah. uh, we have uh, uh, analyzed our situation, mm. our medium-term situation, and we believe we are going to go back to our levels of below 50%. Okay. So if okay. you look at the medium term, we'll be hovering around you know, 47, 48%. So by around 2025, mm. we should be back to where we were before COVID. Okay. Yes. Assuming Remember, the growth continues. Of mm. course, the mm. main assumption is growth continues because this is a ratio. Yeah. Once our GDP increases, of course, of course, and then of course our appetite is also uh, maintained mm. uh, at Realistic. a reasonable level, mm. Mm. then definitely the ratio will go down and we will keep our debt. But definitely there are some specific measures we are put in place. Yeah. One, we are ensuring that uh, we have strengthened the system mm. uh, of uh, identifying projects. So you don't just bring any project before you look at its cost and benefits yeah. and ensure that uh, its rate of return is high. Mm. We don't allow that project in the budget. So we have strengthened what we call the gatekeeping function. Because mm. that's what is very, very important. Actually. How do you ensure that a project comes into the government budget? Mm. So you don't just mm. bring mm. any mm. kind of project and yeah. we allow it. Mm. So we have a system, what we call the uh, public investment management system. Yes which enables us to assess and appraise the project mm. right from the beginning. So it goes through a number of stages. Mm. From when you develop a concept, we scrutinize it. So Step when a, a minister mm. develops a concept for a project, yeah. you submit it to Ministry of Finance. It's actually an online system. Mm. So you go on the on online, you submit this concept to mm. Ministry of Finance. So we assess its benefits and costs. Yeah. So we allow you to go to the next stage, which mm. is a profile. Mm. So once you have done that, you submit, we assess. Then you go to the third stage, which is pre-feasibility. Then you go to feasibility. So we undertake a complete appraisal of this project to mm -hmm. ensure that the benefits you know, are adequate to allow this project to be funded by the government or borrowed for. Okay? And then, of course, we look at the terms of the borrowing. Yeah. So we're also trying to minimize commercial loans mm. yeah. to ensure that, uh, by and large, for many of these projects, we've got some reasonable you know, concession of financing. Mm. Where we cannot, depending, of course, on the rate of return of the project, then that's when we can actually go to commercial borrowing. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. And you see the things you're explaining, it's just information. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that Uganda as a citizen <laughs> mm. does not mm. know. They throw things, mm. but uh, you can't blame them yeah, because sure. they, do, they don't know. Mm. Uh, Julius, mm. on the question of that, I've had you talk about it. Mm. Kenneth has explained their technical side. Mm. From your civil society standpoint, mm. still ought we curtail the appetite even a little bit? Yeah, I, 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 I think for me the question of debt is uh, we, we, we need to shift from this 50% margin everybody talks about. Mm. Because even without COVID, a country like us that has got such a, an infrastructure deficit, yeah. you don't have power, you, the power is not enough, roads mm. are still, we don't have enough roads, you know, the water system. I mean, if you compare yourself to other countries, really, uh, that the kind of revenue you are collecting, yeah. And what we need to do, it's, it, they can't match. Mm. You definitely need to borrow at the end of the day. But I think the biggest challenge is how are we managing the debt? I think mm. that for me that is the, if we can improve on that, 
to see, for example, here money has come and it was meant for this project. Yeah. The project has been completed on time. Yeah. I saw in the in the yes. NDP2 <coughs> audit report. Yes. And there was Auditor General also raising those issues. I, I, I think for me that's that's and I am looking forward to see this PIM system really, the how the whole process goes around. Mm. What do we need to do to improve project implementation? Mm. Because the projects are there. Yeah. Some have not even started. The Auditor General says some have not started before they expire and you keep so I, I think for me project management is one of our biggest challenge than looking at that 50 percent figure mm. let's let's come down and ensure that we, we we do that the other challenge which i have also realized i think for me is this right of way thing mm -hmm. has really delayed the project so much mm. a project is is done very well nights nice, good but at the end of the day somebody has got a shrine along the way and he doesn't want money, even if you give them, you give them a trillion. I remember funny road there in Chigoa, in the, which remained uh, a it's section bad because it's somebody stopped. refused to budge. And because of these international guidelines and uh, and uh, you know guidelines and also uh, laws and policies, yeah. you find an international company can't even actually you know just by you know by bypass it. They mm. will say no, we can't do this road because you need to compensate very well the person who's, who's, who's along it. Uh, and I think for me that's one of the biggest factors that has delayed some of our projects. Yeah. And as long as we don't, then again, that's about project management. As long as we don't deal with those bottlenecks, then we are going to, we all the time we're going to be saying, okay, the 50% search world is going to give us problems. Mm. Simply because we are not finishing our projects, most of our projects on time. Value for money. So for, for me is, one, I am happy that we really look for concessional loans, yeah. which, is, which is very, very, very important. Uh, but also, if we can deal with the issue of project implementation. Mm. And it goes, again, it goes back to these accounting officers. One, I, I mean, I was in one of the town councils. Mm. They built a five-roomed a five office within, f you know, within five months. Okay. And I was telling them that this can't happen here. They said, no, it can happen. Why? Because it can happen. I mean, I'm like, how could you do that? But the guys were very focused. They knew what they wanted. The bill of quantities were done. The money was there. Even if they had finished their office then and they were ready to, mm. to commission it. Mm. So what happens? Okay, that is a small project. But even a bow or some bowls are not even finished. They take forever. So let's, I, I think for me, for me, the, the, the challenge I think I, I throw back to, to, to Kenneth is on, on how we really can improve on the project implementation of mm. government mm. programs. Mm. I, I think somewhere, yes. I, I agree with the uh, uh, genius uh, on that front. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the areas uh, that we'll be tackling actually. Mm. Uh, to ensure that once we borrow money, uh, these resources are absorbed and the project is implemented mm. and implemented on time, of course, yes. and on cost. Mm. Because you can actually implement it on time, but also you have the cost <laughs> over. You go over, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Mm. So, so one of the things we are trying to address now, uh, and we are making a, a complete, you know, review of uh, our public investment program. Yeah. Uh, we're going to analyze all the projects in the public investment program. Mm. If there are some projects, for some reason, uh, which have over delayed, yeah. then we would rather renegotiate or mm. actually stop them. Mm. Yeah. Okay, instead of the continuing the, 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 the loans actually being in our books, yeah. so that we can actually remove those loans in our books. But yeah. of course, going forward, I uh, ensure that we improve on the you know absorption of these resources. Mm. Yeah, contract management. This is one of the main uh, uh, weaknesses. Of course, uh, like you said, uh, there are some things which are a bit external. Yeah. You know, to the accounting officers, uh, particularly like on land acquisition, mm. because uh, if somebody refuses. And I think there was even a similar case uh, on uh, the Kampala Ginger, the planned Kampala Ginger yeah. Expressway, where certain families were, uh, you know, had some kind of conflict. Even the express highway. Then. Exactly. Mm. So those ones are external. And mm. of course, and, uh, as you, must, uh, you, you, you had, yeah. uh, His Excellency the President has put on top of his agenda yeah. the issue of oh. land reform. Mm. So we yeah. hope that uh, in the, this coming government, yeah. the issue of land reform, we also help government, mm. you know, to address uh, land acquisition for government projects. So once that is done, and then we sort out the issues of, uh, you know, poor contract management, mm. overall management, mm. uh, and then of course uh, coupled with what we are going to do to clean up, you know, our portfolio, yeah. uh, we believe we should be able to have. Of course, you cannot uh, ignore the fifty percent. Mm. Fifty percent is like a, a pass mark. It's like saying my aim to pass is eighty percent mm. to be able to get distinction. It's a parameter. Wow. It's a parameter. Mm. So you want to keep measuring yourself. Because, mm -hmm. and this is international practice anyway, yeah. international best practice. Because you know, once you go the other side, depending, of course, on the level of development, then yeah. you are likely to get a problem. Yeah. So you need to keep measuring yourself mm -hmm. to know where you are, 
you, you know, where you are headed uh, to ensure that you don't get, uh, you know, off track. But at the end of the day, of course, all said and done, mm. you cannot avoid borrowing. So I think the key question is, when you borrow, how do you use these how resources? Yes. Because how are you going to uh, create your asset base mm. uh, if you do not borrow? Because at the end of the day, you don't have, have all the domestic resources no. you need mm. to be able to invest. So the only way you can bridge the gap yeah. is by borrowing. Okay. But borrow and ensure that the resources are properly used. Okay. Mm. Yes. We have about four minutes left. I'm, I'm doing the last round. I'm coming to you, Mr. Kato. The citizen is at the center here, and we were not kidding. I like this conversation, <laughs> the one we have been having. Mm. We were, yes, this is the budget we are saying, but in very simple terms. Yes. Mr. Kato, your last word. The citizen and the budget. And the tax. Um, how do you wrap up? How do we, what's the takeaway from this conversation, from your standpoint? Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Yes, the citizen, it's, it's high time that the citizen picks up interest mm. in um, the budget, okay? Uh, of recent, well, uh, the Minister of Finance and URA and other partners have picked up very, very seriously yeah. on educating the people mm. about the budget. And we can see the feedback coming in. Okay. Now the citizen, uh, we can say, is a, a little picking up on information, but now the preparedness mm. on how does the budget hit you? How do you benefit from the budget? It's time for the citizen to seek out information, mm. uh, to get to know how is it going to implement, uh, how is it going to, uh, to affect me? Yeah. How do I tap into the different opportunities? Mm. Uh, some of these policy proposals which come through uh, the Minister of Finance, mm. the opportunities to a number of people Absolutely. who are keen, the investors. Mm. Uh, so people need to know what is in there for them and how can they uh, exploit these opportunities. So the city, it's, it's high time the citizen picks up on the interest of government, the direction of government, yeah. the national development plan, mm. what is government planning and how can uh, an agile citizen prepare to tap into uh, that. Of course for us at, U at, at URA, uh, the more uh, the, the more receptive that the citizens are of a, of, of, of government policies, the easier, yeah. the easier for us mm. to do our work. The easier for us to engage, you know, and the easier for us to engage our our supervisors, the ministry, so that we we, we can come up with uh, with better ways of doing uh, work that involves the, the citizen. You have had so Kenneth explain the seemingly the, the things that bring wrong perception. Perhaps you need to engage me so finance, not as your boss, but as a partner, yes. maybe in a program, <laughs> <laughs> to, to make sure people, they go with you mm. yes. as you do your outreaches. Kenneth, your final submission as we end. Okay, I think the key point I want to make to the citizens, first and foremost, uh, uh, we all need to appreciate that the budget is one single instrument mm. That impacts on the lives of the citizens. Either they know it or they don't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very absolutely. Whether you know it or you don't <laughs> know it. Either way, it will impact. Mm. Either in terms of you benefiting from yeah. the services yeah. that are delivered by the government mm. or from you paying taxes to URA. Yeah. So that's why it is extremely important that people take interest, mm. keen interest, in issues that arise out of the budget. It is extremely important that people understand the budget, yeah. internalize it, mm. understand indeed, uh, like uh, my colleague has said, mm. you know, how do I take advantage of this budget? What are, what are the opportunities mm. that arise out of this budget? Yeah. So that I can actually take advantage of the opportunities and mm. seize the moment yeah. of the, those opportunities. But also they need to look at the other side of it. Mm. You know, how do they ensure that the government is delivering the services that government has actually promised to deliver, mm. okay? especially at their level, at the locality. So they need to demand, yeah. you know, for better services. They need to demand, you know, from the people who are delivering the services, accountability mm. to be able to understand. If you promised uh, in a, a locality, you know, to construct a road, and actually what they do, they, uh, they even put it in their work plan. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, do citizens pick interest to go and find out whether that road was constructed? And, and yet the road... Are well they, they are They are councillors. And actually the road is passing by you know, their households, yeah. but they don't pick interest. And at the end of the day, of course, who, who loses? It is the citizens. Yeah. So that's why I call upon the citizens to ensure that they pick a lot of interest in their budget. Okay. Yes. Do you ask your final submission? Uh, just two things. One, uh, of course, is to... Uh, I, I rarely see Kenneth on, on, on TVs. <laughs> <laughs> explaining these things yeah. in such a kind. So he was so... Yes, uh, yeah. It was so nice, yeah. 
uh, you know, in a, sim a simpler uh, language yeah. uh, for people to understand. I, I think it's, it's important that we listen, we hear from the, the people who are yeah. in charge of this day-to-day -day running of uh, operations of, uh, of the budget. Mm -hmm. But the most important thought for me is, I think my parting shot also is that uh, as a citizen, your government is what you have nearest to you. Mm -hmm. It is, it is that school, it is that power hall, it is that health center, mm -hmm. it is that community road. You know, forget about the express highways. There are other people who are, who are really who looking are concerned at about them. But mm -hmm. another person really just, co just concentrate on ensure that those work and are functional. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm very sure that money goes there. Yeah. Money actually goes to those particular places. But the implementation and utilization is our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the duty to us as citizens to ensure that we demand that accountability. Yeah. That go to that health center and see whether the budget has been pinned on the notes board. Mm -hmm. Go to that uh, sub county, to that school, to in any uh, uh, service delivery unit to see that money has been budgeted for and look out how if things have been done. Mm -hmm. This business of be our government mm. should really, it's really stop. Because important. be our government is you. You are mm. the government. You are mm. the citizens. Like he said, we pay the taxes. Yeah. So if things don't work, then we are the ones to, uh, to, uh, to lose. So I call upon the city definitely to get involved in the national budget uh, process. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, viewers, I hope you found this conversation very uh, educative. Certainly, we did not touch everything we ought to. But it is a budget month and there are going to be other opportunities to discuss other things in the budget that concern you. It's not as complicated as it should be. And uh, we have been discussing uh, under the theme, how is the budget shaping up the role of the citizen in the budget process, part of the budget month, brought to you by Minister of Finance and uh, uh, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group and its partners. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon.